Hello and welcome to lecture six. We're going to be discussing cash and liquidity management. Um, similar to our last lecture, lecture five, we are now venturing into um, areas of corporate finance that um, are required more on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not making these massive decisions on whether or not to acquire a company or build a new con um, uh, manufacturing plant. We're just trying to make sure that we have enough cash in our bank account um, when we need it, and not too much and not too little. So let's, let's dive in. This comes from chapter 19 of your book. The key concepts and skills we'll be covering. First, we're gonna outline the importance of float, and we'll define what float means, and how it affects cash balances. Um, then we will explain how firms manage their cash and some of the collection concentration and disbursement techniques that are used. And we'll describe the advantages and disadvantages to holding cash and some of the ways to invest our idle cash. So what reasons do we have to hold cash? Well, the first potential reason for holding cash is a speculative motive. This is when, we, when the company holds cash to take advantage of unexpected opportunities. Um, maybe um, you want to have cash available to buy a piece of property on a moment's notice or, or other types of uh, purchases that you may not have a lot of forewarning. Um, so those are speculative motives. So the cash is sitting there ready just in case. Precautionary motives um, are when we hold cash in case of emergencies. So just in case something um, bad happens. Um, the typical one that we always see in, in every business is the transaction motive, and this is to hold enough cash to pay the day-to-day -to -day -to -day bills, like keeping the lights on and paying our utilities. Um, there's a trade-off, however. There's a trade-off between the opportunity cost of holding cash relative to the transaction cost of converting marketable securities to cash for transactions. So um, if it's not being held in our bank account in cash, um, we can obviously purchase marketable, marketable securities, um, which could then be so, sold fairly quickly. They're pretty liquid, but they're not immediate. Um, if you have it in stock or some sort of money market, um, uh, you're going to end up taking at least a day to liquidate um, and receive the proceeds, uh, typically even longer. And so if you need the money today, Having it in marketable securities can be an issue. Also, when you sell those marketable securities, there's typically going to be a transaction cost. So this trade-off between um, the opportunity cost of having cash readily available and um, trying to earn a little bit more in marketable securities but having to pay transaction costs um, has to be weighed out. And so our goal as a CFO or as uh, corporate finance executives is to um, have, have the optimal amount of cash on hand. So um, I mentioned we would discuss what float means. Uh, float is a very important concept when we're talking about cash management. Float is the difference between cash, the cash balance recorded in the cash account. So what's, what your accounting system says uh, that you have in cash and the cash balance recorded at the bank. So the bank might have a different balance than um, what your accounting system says. Well, the difference between the two is what we call float. It's because money is in transit and it either hasn't left um, or, or been received at the bank um, or, or vice versa. So uh, we've got uh, the first type of float is called a disbursement float. And that's when we as a firm are writing checks. So when we write a check, we'll typically write it out of our accounting system. And the accounting system automatically does a journal entry to reduce cash. So our book balance in our accounting system is now less. Uh, it's, it's minus the amount uh, of the check that we just wrote. However, that check has not may, uh, been sent to whoever we're paying and they haven't deposited it in their bank and it hasn't cleared our bank. So the available balance at the bank uh, minus the book balance will be greater than zero. This is what we call a disbursement float. And this can be um, very deceiving um, 
you can look online at your bank account and think, oh, I've got all this money. Um, but if you don't look at your accounting books, the book balance, you may not realize that you have written a bunch of checks uh, that are going to clear at some future date and reduce your bank balance. So disbursement float is one. The next one is collection float. This is when checks uh, received increase our book balance before the bank uh, credits the account. So uh, we go to the mailbox, we check, um, and we see that we've received a couple of checks. So we enter those into our accounting system and we create a deposit to take it to the bank. Well, it might take a day or two or three for it to clear the bank. Um, and as a result of that, there's gonna be a difference between our book balance and the bank uh, balance. So with the collection float, um, the available balance at the bank is uh, minus the book balance is less than zero. So our book balance is higher than the available balance at the bank in that situation. Then we can combine these two to get our net float. It's the disbursement float plus the collection float. Okay, so here's a little example. These are the different types of floats and how you would calculate them. You've got $3,000 in your checking account today. You just received $2,000 and deposited it um, today. And you wrote a check today for $2,500. So the question is, what is the disbursement float? Remember, that is when we write a check, but it hasn't cleared the bank. The disbursement float is $2,500. It's this check that's outstanding. It hasn't gone against our bank balance. It hasn't reduced that by $2,500. Um, and so it's out there floating. Um, once it clears, it'll reduce our checking account. What's the collection float? Well, in this case, it's $2,000. We've received a check in the mail. It hasn't cleared the bank yet, so the amount is $2,000. What is the net float? So remember, this is where we combine the two. So it's the $25,000 minus the $2,000. So we've got this check. Um, minus that we wrote minus the check that we are depositing and so the net float is five hundred dollars so our book balance we would calculate that by with our our, our current balance at the bank um, is three thousand plus the two thousand that we've just deposited uh, in our books uh, minus the two thousand five hundred in the check that we wrote so our our book balance should say two thousand five hundred and you can see how that's different uh, the bank, if you call the bank today or go online, it's going to say that your balance is 3000 And if you look at your accounting system, it's going to say your balance is 2500 And so uh, that is the difference caused by the float, uh, the disbursement float and the collection float. And you can see that the 3000 minus our net float equals 2500 So our available balance today, what is our available balance? It's 3000 right now. Um, that's because the bank has no idea about the check that's being deposited or the check that we wrote. All they know is, is what's been communicated to them. So how do we measure the float? The size of the float depends on the dollar amount and the time delay. So here we're going to add um, uh, the delay that it takes uh, to either leave or reach the bank. So here's the delay. Uh, we've, it's usually made up of mailing time, so the check is in the mail, plus the processing delay, plus the availability delay. So suppose you mail a check each month for $1,000, and it takes three days to reach its destination. That's the mailing time, three days. One day to process, so their, uh, uh, their cash clerk there at their company will uh, take the day to deposit it and one day before the bank makes the cash available. Okay, so how many days is that? What's the, what is the average daily float? This is something that we'd want to be aware of. What is the average daily float? And this is assuming a 30-day month. So our first method is we take the three days mailing time, the one day processing delay, and the one day availability delay, um, and we multiply it by our check. So five days, times the check amount divided by the number of days in the month. So our average daily float is $166.67. Another way of looking that, at that is we can take 
five out of 30 days times the thousand plus 25 out of 30 days times zero. This means there are 25 days a month where there, the float is not outstanding um, and there are five days in a month where the float is outstanding. So this math obviously works out to be the same, $166.67 is our average daily float. So what is the cost of this float? Well, the cost of float um, is the opportunity cost of not being able to use the money. Uh, it's, it's in transit, we can't get at it, we can't use it. So suppose the average daily float is $3 million with a weighted average delay of five days. So we've got $3 million average and the delay is five days. So what is the total amount unavailable to earn interest? We've got the five days times the $3 million float. It equals at any given time, we're gonna have on average $15,000 that is um, waiting to be deposited in our bank. It's in process, it's floating out there. And while it's floating, we are not earning interest on that money. You can see how that might add up fairly quickly. So how do we remedy to this? How do we fix this float? Well, there are different uh, opportunities and we'll discuss a few to um, reduce the delay um, from the, the five days that we had. So what is the net present value of a project that could reduce the delay by three days? So we're going to reduce this five day delay by three days, but it's gonna cost us $8 million to reduce that delay. So there's some system that we're implementing that's gonna cost us the equivalent of $8 million. Um, so we've got our immediate cash inflow which is three days, we're gonna save uh, uh, the delay of three days. So three days times 3 million. So we're going to have $9 million hitting our account. Um, uh, and so we can calculate the net present value as the $9 million of cash inflow minus the $8 million, the cost to implement this new project or system. So our NPV is $1 million. So in this case, if, if NPV is positive, uh, we're going to want to implement this new system um, and pay the $8 million in order to get our cash to us more quickly. So um, here is a, a diagram of the cash collection process. So one of the goals of float management is to try to reduce the collection delay. This whole thing is our collection delay. The payment is mailed. The mailing time uh, is here then the payment's received, then it takes time to process that, that payment internally, uh, payment is then deposited in the bank, and it takes some time from the time we deposit it until the time the cash is available uh, for use or to earn interest. So our goal as management is to reduce the, the time. There are several techniques that can reduce uh, various parts of, of this delay, whether it be the mailing time, the processing delay, or the availability delay. So how do we accelerate collections? Uh, here is an example, this is part one. Your company does business nationally, so across the nation, and currently all checks are sent to the headquarters in Tampa, Florida. So whether um, the customer is in Washington State or in New York, um, all customers mail their um, checks in to our headquarters in Tampa. And you can see how it might take a long time. We're considering a lockbox system that will have checks processed in Phoenix, St. Louis, and Philadelphia. The Tampa office will continue to process the checks it receives in-house. Okay, so with a lockbox system, we can have, um, instead of mailing it all to our Tampa, Florida office, those that are closest to Phoenix can mail it to Phoenix, uh, closest to St. Louis or closest to, to Philadelphia uh, would mail it there. So our, our Washington State customers would mail it to Phoenix probably, our Philadelphia, or sorry, our New York customers would mail it to Philadelphia. Um, what this means is that the checks are not in the mail for as long. Um, and so we can get a potential benefit, but these lockbox box systems are not free. 
So the collection time will be reduced by two days on average. Daily interest rate on T-bills, so this is the short-term interest rate, um, the daily interest rate is 0.01%. Um, so that's what we'd expect to earn every day um, on the amount. The average number of daily payments to each lockbox is 5,000. Um, the average size of payment is 500. The processing fee, however, this is the lockbox system cost. Processing fee is 10 cents per check plus a $10 um, wire fund uh, fee to wire funds to a centralized bank at the end of each day. So um, what happens are each of the checks are deposited and wired to a centralized bank at the end of each day. So um, now let's look at how do we calculate whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. So the first thing we'll look at are the benefits. So our average daily collections um, would be at the three different locations. Remember we said there would be 5,000 um, uh, checks received uh, with, for an average of $500 at three different locations. So our average daily collections at our lockbox locations will be $7.5 million. Um, so uh, the increased bank balance, um, you remember it increases or reduces uh, the uh, collection time by two days. So the increased bank balance is the two uh, days times the 7.5 million. So $15 million is the potential benefit. But the costs here, we've got 10 cents per check. Remember there are 5,000 checks at um, three different locations. So 15,000 checks in general plus uh, the wire transfer, of uh, which costs us $10, and that would happen from each of the three locations. So the total daily cost would be $1,530. Well, are we gonna earn enough interest in order to cover the daily cost? The present value of the daily cost um, is going to be $15.3 million. Um, so this is, uh, the present value, we take the daily cost of 1530, we divide it by um, the daily T-bill rate. Remember it was 0.01% or um, if we look at that as a decimal, that's 0.0001. And so that equals 15,300,000. So our NPV is we're gonna gain 15 million, but it's gonna cost us 15,300,000 for a loss uh, or a negative net present value of a negative three hundred thousand uh, dollars, the company should not accept this lockbox proposal. Uh, they will lose money, uh, not gain money. Now let's talk about cash disbursements. Um, slowing down payments can increase dis disbursement float, but it may not be the ethical or op or the optimal optimal thing to do. So. Um, we can um, uh, pay our suppliers more slowly. We can take the, the slowest way to pay them. Um, and uh, the question is, well, is that ethical or not? Um, when I worked uh, as CFO of the company I worked for, um, what we did is we proactively spoke to our suppliers. And we said, hey, um, this is the way we'd like to pay. This is how long we think it'll take. Do you have any issues with that? Um, and because we were a good customer, they allowed us to do that. And so it increased our disbursement float, which helped us to have the cash in our bank longer um, um, and increase the time for, it to, for them to receive it. But they agreed to it um, and, uh, and seemed to be okay with it. So uh, in that case, um, I don't feel that it was unethical because all parties were aware of what was happening and agreed uh, to that. But sometimes some companies will purposefully um, uh, slow down their payments. And when um, maybe the supplier calls them to say, hey, where's your check? You can, and I've, I've heard people say, well, the check is in the mail. We sent it off two days ago or two weeks ago. It hasn't arrived yet when they know full well that the check has not arrived yet because um, they made it slower. Okay, so um, now let's look at controlled disbursements. We've first got a, what we call a zero balance account. 
Um, this is something that we instituted at um, the company I worked for. We had what we called um, a sweep account, um, which held all the cash. And that sweep account had a higher interest rate that it was um, earning. Then we had a bunch of what we called zero balance accounts. And technically, they weren't zero. Um, the bank required $1 to stay in those accounts. So for instance, we'd have a, a zero balance payroll account, a zero balance accounts payable account. So if we wrote it a check and it went to an employee for payroll, um, what would happen is the check would hit that account that only had $1. And the amount of that check would be swept over or deposited from our sweep account into the payroll account. Same with the accounts payable uh, uh, account. If we wrote a check and it was uh, uh, deposited in the uh, supplier's bank and, um, and then attempted to clear our bank, what would happen is the bank, again, automatically transfers over the amount of that check from the sweep account into the accounts payable account. So that's a zero balance account. Um, then there's a, uh, there are controlled disbursement accounts. I've actually never worked with controlled disbursement accounts, but with this, um, uh, almost all payments that need to be made in a given day are known in the morning that day. So the bank would inform the company how much the firm needs to deposit in that account in order for all the checks to be able to clear that account. So that's what we call a controlled disbursement account. Next, we're gonna discuss investing in cash. Um, one way to invest our excess cash is in money markets. Uh, money market securities are financial instruments with an original maturity of one year or less. So treasury bills, um, those are uh, uh, fixed income or financial instruments that are issued by the U.S. Treasury, um, commercial paper. There are many different types of money market securities. Temporary cash surpluses. So sometimes we will have temporary cash surpluses. These can be seasonal or cyclical. Um, in, in these instances where we have more cash than we normally would um, need, we would buy marketable securities such as money market with our seasonable surpluses and convert securities back to cash when we start to see deficits, when we start to need that cash. Um, there can also be planned or possible expenditures. Um, so we can accumulate marketable securities in anticipation of upcoming uh, expenses. So rather than just let it sit in, sit in our checking account, um, we can, if we know that there's a possible expenditure in the future and we have an idea of when that will be, we can anticipate that and we can start accumulating the, the amount that we need in marketable securities that are earning uh, a, a little bit higher interest. So this shows um, figure 19.6 from your book. Uh, this uh, is the seasonal cash demands. Okay, so we've got this line, the wavy line, is our total financing need. Um, and right here, this uh, straight line um, is the amount uh, that we would um, keep in cash. So we've got four different quarters. These are the, the dollar amounts. Our total financing need is here. Um, that goes up and down. Um, and we've got two different sections here. We've got a short-term financing and a long-term financing. So let's look at time one. You can see time one right here. Um, our total financing need is below the amount of cash that we have. So a surplus of cash flow exists. Seasonal demand for assets is low at this point. The surplus cash flow is invested in short-term marketable securities. So right here, we'll see that uh, right here at time three as well. What about time two? In this case, our financing need is higher than the amount of cash we have. So we've got a deficit cash flow. Seasonal demand for assets is high. The financial deficit is financed by selling our marketable securities first and then by borrowing from the bank. So this could be um, a line of credit from the bank or, or other forms of borrowing. 
And so here we've got excess, here we don't have enough, so we've got to market. So what are the characteristics of short-term securities? Well, I already mentioned uh, typically um, they're less than a year. The maturity of the short-term uh, securities, uh, firms often limit the maturity of short-term investments to 90 days, so three months, uh, no more, to avoid loss of principal due to changing interest rates. Um, also, you want to be aware of default risk. You want to avoid investing in marketable securities with significant default risk. And a lot of the uh, short-term marketable securities have uh, ratings that um, are from ratings agencies, so you can see whether or not um, there's a lot of default risk. Uh, marketability. How easy would it be to sell these securities and convert them to cash? There are some, um, uh, some of the investments that we would not be able to sell quickly. There's just nobody to buy it. If there's nobody to buy it, then how could we sell it? And so uh, we could convert it to cash very quickly. The last is taxability. We want to consider different tax characteristics when making a decision. And uh, there are a lot of uh, different uh, potential um, fixed income investments that are short term. And some of them require us to pay um, different types of tax. Some of them can be tax exempt. So we want to look at those um, as we consider them. Okay, that, that wraps things up. What I want you to do is I want you to look through um, these quiz questions and try and answer them yourself. What are the major reasons for holding cash? What is the difference between disbursement float and collection float? How does a lockbox system work? What are the major characteristics of short-term securities? Uh, I highly recommend looking at the book. It's got some great information on each of these. Also, I want you to ask yourself this ethics issue question. Some corporations routine, routinely pay late or take discounts that they do not qualify for. Um, so how does this impact the supplier? Does this action have any negative impact on the company itself? And finally, um, I want you to try and work through the comprehensive problem. I won't read through this right here. The answer to this comprehensive problem is in the notes section of this PowerPoint presentation. So go to Canvas and download the PowerPoint and you can see um, how we calculate uh, the answer to this problem. If you've got any questions, feel free to give me a call. I'm uh, available uh, during my office hours. If you need to speak outside of my office hours, just shoot me an email and we can chat um, when uh, it's convenient for both of us. Thank you very much.